Thanks, Matt. All right, we'll just open our Bibles to the book of Jonah. As was mentioned, it was a great prayer and fast and some great talks there. And, uh, you know, with us, it started on Friday night about being thankful. And I got this talk together before the prayer and fast or knowing what the um, theme of it was or anything. But it just so happens it works in a little bit with it. But um, maybe the Lord's got a message for us and... And uh, <clears throat> when we look at it, I suppose, you know, when we come to meetings or we hear the spiritual gifts, whatever we do, it, you know, if we're here because of God, then we believe everything is of God and uh, the encouragement there for us. And I um, just want to have a look at a few thoughts about um, Jonah here, but the theme for my talk is don't be entitled, be thankful. And I suppose... You know, just looking up this, these thoughts, this generation they say is a very entitled generation, and and um, even in the Lord, sometimes we we can become a little bit like that, entitled. And the word entitled, it just um, it, it simple meaning. It just says feeling that you have the right to do or have what you want without, without having to work for it or deserve it, just because of who you are, and. Even though we're spirit-filled and even though we're baptised and uh, we're sons and daughters of the living God, it's not automatic that we we can come to God and just be entitled to everything. But, um, of course, the Lord does give us everything. He's given us eternal life. He's given us all the blessings. He's, he's given us an abundance. But um, sometimes I suppose we come to a point where we think, well, I deserve this. And it's not that it's a balance between, I suppose, um, working for it and um, the grace of the Lord. And, and, you know, the Bible says faith without works is dead. So there's certain works we need to have in the Lord. We need to be involved in the Lord. We need to put everything we have to the Lord. And um, as far as that goes, we give our service unto the Lord. But we're just going to read here about Jonah and um, um, for those who don't know the story this was about uh, the prophet there uh, the son of Amittai and uh, he was told to go to Nineveh a, a great um, city it says of 120,000 people and he was uh, told to go there and preach the word of God and uh, he, it's very much like us isn't it each and every one of us the Lord requires us to do things he says to us, go and do this. And uh, we've got incredible encouragement in the Bible as to what we need to do. We don't even need to ask. We can see it all there. I mean, Mark 16, for example, go and preach the gospel. We've all got that commission. There's, there's other things we can see there that we've, we've all been given. But um, this um, man, Jonah, who was a prophet, or uh, he was one of uh, the first prophets in Israel there, he was required to go there and uh, preach to Nineveh, and, and God had chosen him. He could see that he had this ability for some reason, and uh, he'd chosen him out of many people to go and do this task. But he wasn't um, prepared to, and he went exactly the opposite way to what God required him to. And how often have we done that, all of us? You know, maybe hidden, tried to, you know, run away from the things that the Lord's called us unto. But um, what happened was when he went to Nineveh, he was in a, a ship, the Bible says, and he, he, um, it says they cast lots because uh, he, he said to them, look, we're in this big storm here, they're about to die, and this is going to happen because I've been told to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. And uh, he said, you need to throw me overboard, and, uh, you know, if, what happened, of course, in the end, they cast lots and they chose who was going to throw him overboard. They threw him overboard and God was gracious unto him and he landed in a big fish. And um, the big fish swallowed him up and he was in there for three days and three nights. And, you know, there's, there's a reference to this in the New Testament, which we're going to read. For many of us, I, I guess it's a well-known story, but you think about this. He was in that fish for three days and three nights. There was a lot to think about at that time. You know, I mean, you can imagine the gastric juices there trying to devour him. <laughs> you know, it was pitch black. You know, it, he stunk. The only thing to eat was raw fish. And he didn't know how long he was going to be there. And 
Maybe we feel a little, little bit like that at times, that we're in a bit of a dark hole, we're in this place where we can't get out, where, where you know, there's, there's things that stink around us. And uh, we, we feel like, how long am I going to be in this situation? How long do I have to bear with this? And maybe Jonah at this time was just thinking, I just want to die. And what we read about Jonah a, a couple of times, he actually says that, I just want to die. You know, that's how fed up he was. And, and uh, it wasn't when he was in the fish's belly. It was later on, actually, that it says that. And, um, and maybe we can feel like that in, in, in life where uh, we're compassed about. Um, <clears throat> you know, in chapter 2 of Jonah, we just read in verse 5, The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. You know, and... He, it talks about how he went into the depths of the sea. And for those who remember Brad Noble's talk, it's, I can't remember exactly, but it's a long way from here to, um, to McDonald's. Is that right, Brad? A bit further, there you go. The, the depths of the sea. So, so he was in this great fish, not knowing where he was going to be. And, uh, and maybe we're like that. We feel like we're, we're going down into the depths of the sea. We're you know, we've got uh, problems wrap, wrapped around our whole life there, and what are we going to do? And of course, you can imagine Jonah there, he was praying unto God. <laughs> we would be, wouldn't we? And, and is he the first person to ever been inside of a fish, a great whale? He's actually not. I thought he was, but uh, some time ago I was actually, I can't remember, there was this story come up on the internet there, and it was talking about um, this um, person by the name of Marquez. He was a 56-year-old fisherman, Luigi Marquez. Uh, he was swallowed by a whale after a great storm as well, as it turns out. And uh, he was inside this um, whale for a few days there. He says, It was the most frightening thing I've ever lived. Everything was pitch black and I was shivering cold. The only thing that kept me alive were the raw fish I ate and the light from my waterproof watch. He was fortunate, wasn't he? Jonah didn't have a waterproof watch. <laughs> that is how I kept in touch with time and the smell I will never forget, the horrible stench of putrid decomposition I had to wash for three days before the odour went away. And apparently, as it turns out, his wife was actually praying for him and he come out of this... I can imagine... You ever had a bath for a long time and become shriveled up? You can imagine after being three days <laughs> in a bath how shriveled up he was. You know, if you leave the kids in the bath for a long time and they completely shrivel up, you know, the, you know their skin. So this man here, that happened to him. Another guy, apparently, James Bartley... The story has reported that, in, that during a whaling expedition off the Falkland, Falkland Islands, Bartley's boat was attacked by the whale and he landed inside the whale's mouth. He survived the ordeal and was carved out of the stomach by his peers when they, not knowing he was inside, caught and began skinning the whale because the hot weather otherwise would have rotted the whale meat. It was said that Bartley was inside the whale for 36 hours that his skin had been bleached by the gastric juices and that he was blind the rest of his life. And, and so he, apparently he died 18 years later. But, you know, there's a few cases. So, um, you know, you, you can't imagine that. And maybe there's things you, you're going through that nobody else can imagine. And, uh, you know, there doesn't seem a way out. If you were caught in this whale, I mean, this guy here, both of these people and, of course, Jonah, they would have thought their life was over. And um, <clears throat> incredibly, you know, there was actually a young girl as well who, uh, it turns out, was in a whale for, for a very short period of time. She'd been swallowed. Apparently, it's the blue whale. So maybe Jonah was swallowed by a blue whale. We don't know. But one thing we do know is he was in this situation... And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I suppose he turned away from what God had wanted him to do. He wasn't prepared to do what he was uh, encouraged to do. But the reason I've read that whole story is in chapter 3, verse 10. And um, in the end, he ended up going to Nineveh and preaching the gospel. And Nineveh repented. 
And uh, it's an incredible situation because Jonah walks through the middle of this um, city, Nineveh, of 120,000 people and the, and the king's there and he, he gets everyone to um, do exactly what he's required. Uh, as Jonah says to them, you need to repent, turn from, re- evil, from your evil ways. And they all turn their lives around. And uh, the amazing thing is... Jonah was actually entitled, if you like. It says in verse, chapter 4, verse 1, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? <laughs> Jonah's quite proud, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's very entitled. He, he, he's actually questioning God, and he's saying, God, I knew you were going to do this. You know, I knew how you work and how you do things. And uh, it's amazing, this story, really, because God works with Jonah and he works with us. Even when we've fallen short, even when we are a bit entitled or we we think we have the right to do what we want, to, uh, as it says, a a feeling that you have right to do or have what you want. And uh, like I said, this generation... um, you know, I mean, sometimes they say it's the younger ones who are entitled, but uh, as far as us in the Lord, we can all feel entitled at times that, uh, you know, this should be done that way. The oversight should do this. You know, when we read about the book of Laodicea there, sorry, the church of Laodicea, it was in the hand, hands of the laity. The people were trying to decide what was going to happen. And uh, we're in that church in the last days where those are the type of things we've got to be careful of, of becoming entitled, of becoming those people who, who are questioning rather than, okay, Lord, here am I, send me. And uh, this, this is um, what... God wanted out of Jonah, so much so that he he taught him a bit of a lesson as we're going to read about. Um, um, He says, halfway through verse 2, Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, a repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord... Take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to live, to die than to live. Yeah, he's been in the whale for you know the fish for three days and three nights. He could have died at any time. He could never have come out. And because God has saved some people, he's questioning God and says, "I want to die." I don't know who understands that. Put your hand up if you understand that, because I don't get it. <laughs> But he obviously wasn't doing things the way God required of him. So, like I said, God tries to show him a way of listening to what he's got to say. Then said the Lord, Doest thou will to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. So he was waiting for the city to be destroyed. He sat on the other side. He he built this little tent-type situation where he could dwell there to see what was going to happen. He still wanted the city to be destroyed. And maybe we're a little little bit like that at times where, I don't know about you, there's times where I think, Lord, just come back. (laughs) I'm done with this world. You know, I just want you to come back. I don't want to be here anymore. I just want you, you to return. But then you think... Lord, there's more te- people to be saved. That's what we're here for. And, and you know, it, it's a balance, I guess. Yes, we walk each and every day with the Lord. But on the other hand, we're thinking, Lord, here am I. Use me. Send me. What can I do? And uh, Jonah here was, uh, like I said, it was, it was a simple lesson the Lord taught him where he, um, at, at this time, it says that, that he prepared a gourd for him, a go- a G-O-U-R-D, however you want to say that, gourd. It's a plant anyway that grows up quite big and it actually sheltered him at this time, verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come uh, over Jonah that it might shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly, exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished him in himself to die. This guy, honestly, he, he wants to die just because he's getting hot. He's got some serious problems. But when we look at this situation, 
God, you know, this, these gourds apparently take about 18 months to grow and here it is, God just produces one in a day and takes it away in a day. And what he was doing was showing to Jonah, I believe, look, I'm in control. I can do whatever I want. If I wanted to destroy that city, Nineveh, that 120,000 people, I could. But for me, I wanted to see them saved. I could see repentance within them. And, uh, you know, I've, I've produced this gourd for you, this plant that's sheltering you from the sun, and I've taken it away by sending an east wind. So I can take it away at any time. So God is in control. And whatever situation we're in, we've got to see that, that God is in control. And, and that came out very clearly in the um, prayer and fast on the weekend. You know, that whatever we come across, our brother Brian there saying, you know, he, he's so nice the way he puts things. You know, we just need to relax and trust in the Lord. <laughs> That's not me. That's <laughs> I'd say, no, we just need to trust in the Lord. <laughs> but, but I suppose, you know, Jonah here, you know, he got upset at whatever God was doing, but God was still working with him. He was just an angry man, it appears. He was just a person who wanted everything his own way. He was just being entitled, but, but the Lord was working with him. And, of course, in the end... You know, these uh, people ended up getting saved and the Lord continued to work with Jonah. As he continues to work with us in our situations, and we are going to go through some situations where the Lord teaches us things, all the people said. So it's best to learn early so we don't end up in the fish, fish's belly. Yeah. <laughs> Horrible thought, isn't it? We're not going to go there, but um, we'll just go to... Um, <clears throat> Book of Matthew in chapter 12. There's a couple of reasons I just want to read this. One, because, you know, a lot of people don't believe that... um, that Jonah ever existed or was in the belly for three days and three nights. And, and um, like I said, it, it amazed me when you find out there's others who've been inside a, a fish's belly and survived, you know. But, you know, Jesus used it as an example about, you know, about repentance and about many people who have the opportunity to follow the Lord, but they actually don't appreciate it. They feel entitled to do their own thing rather than doing what God requires of them. And uh, the religious leaders at the time were like this. And Jesus was talking to the Pharisees at the time. And uh, they, they were saying, look, Master, you know, they're calling him Master, but they really weren't interested in the things he was saying. And uh, we read there at the end of um, verse 38, it says, we would see a sign from thee. So how often do people say that? You know, you're witnessing to them and they say, oh, yeah, you show me you're speaking in tongues. And you think, no, I'm, I would never do that. You know, the Bible, I, I believe that's casting pearl before swine if we just speak in tongues with them like that. You know, because we've got the, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost and we're not going to just speak in tongues for them to be able to mock it and to say, you know, to uh, say things about it and that. But uh, if they're prepared to pray to receive the Holy Spirit, well, that's different. You know, it's to- two totally different attitudes. And, and this is what Jesus was talking about here, different attitudes. And it says in verse 39, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Or he was going to die, wasn't he? He was going to be crucified. In verse 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented not, repented at the... Sorry, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So the people of Nineveh, they repented, and yet we've got a generation where there doesn't seem to be much repentance, where there's a lot of people, you know, it it can be difficult at times to find those who want to hear. 
But, you know, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up in judgment against this generation. That's what Jesus said, because they, they didn't believe in Jesus Christ, because they weren't prepared to do what Jesus Christ says. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an example here, ex you know, for other people to make sure they do what Jesus says, or there will be judgment, or Jesus Christ is going to return, and you're not going to be saved. And for each and every one of us, of course, we look at Scripture scriptures like this and we just want to make sure that we're on the right side of judgment you know we want to make sure that in our hearts we're still you know there and lord you know repenting from the things of this world staying away and not being drawn in you know as um, one of the gifts was saying there about our lives being about the lord and and other things we think important you know, they're not as important as we think they are. The Lord is the most important thing. And, and there's another reference to this um, same chapter in, in um, Mark 12. We're just going to quote it. But it, after this story here, it says how Jesus went into the, um, the boat and they questioned him about bread. You know, and, and he just sighed deeply, it says. It was like, you're so worried about, you know, can you imagine it? Uh, you're worried about bread. I'm talking about the judgment of, of you know, and the preaching of uh, Jonas where 120,000 people, you know, repented of their ways and came to their realisation they needed to change their lives and, and about me who was going to die and Jesus, not me, who was going to die and rise again and you're worried about bread. And he says to them, you know, don't worry about the bread. Remember when there was, you know, I broke five loaves of bread and fed the 5,000. Don't worry about those things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, as the Bible says, and all things will be added unto you. Sometimes we can get bogged down with the small things and we forget about the 120,000 because Jonah went and preached the gospel. And as we preach the gospel, you know, the people who are going to come and do come and it's exciting to see people come and uh, you know we keep building relationships and and uh, the Lord blesses our lives of course we'll just go to Luke chapter 17 <clears throat> now this is a story about um, Ten lepers, but I was just going to get Tina to come up and give a brief testimony about someone. I haven't. I told the people up there we're going to do that. But um, this is about ten lepers and about how you know we're going to read about nine of them approached it one way and one approached it the other. And uh, when we look at this story, it's a it's a story of maybe where where we are today in this world and. Um, First time she's done what I said. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you want me to focus on? Oh, okay. Um, so my closest friend from uh, high school, Angela, her name is, you know, obviously growing up, witness to her, she was brought up a Greek Orthodox, so it, it was, you know, she could never come to anything, but... Um, when Kevin and I were married and we went to visit her, she lives in Melbourne, and we went to visit her when we first got married and we spent the weekend with her and she was showing us through her house and she had, all the, she had a room full of doctor's reports and scans and I said to her, what's wrong with you, Angela? And she said, oh, haven't I told you, um, you know, she's, she's had some severe um, health issues um, around, you know, um, her reproduct reproductive organs. So she had endometriosis, fibroids, and um, ovarian cysts, so all three of them. And she's had 13 operations in the last five years. And at this stage, she was 40 years old. And she'd only just been married a couple of years. And um, I said to her, wow, that must be really hard. Um, I said, are you trying to conceive? And she said, oh, that's not going to happen. Um, I've already been told not even to bother with IVF. And she's a very well-off woman. And um, anyway, and I said to her, do you want to have a child? And she's like, oh, of course I do. And I said, well, Kevin and I will pray for you. So Kevin and I had a prayer and fast for her. 
and a few months later, <laughs> what do you know, <laughs> um, she was pregnant, and which was ama amazing, number one, she was over 40, and that she'd had all these problems, and the whole way through her pregnancy, um, you know, she was told she was going to have all these problems. She, you know, she was probably going to miscarry or there was going to be something wrong with the child. Anyway, we, you know, we heard she had a baby. It was awesome. Praise the Lord. And she admitted it was a miracle. She told everyone it was a miracle. She said that our church had prayed for her. So it was awesome to have that recognition that the Lord had done that amazing thing. Anyway, fast forward eight years. We met up with her again a few weeks ago. She came back to Adelaide um, for a visit and we caught up with her for dinner. And we're just talking and, um, you know, talking about her eight-year-old, how she's asking about the Lord. And her husband got angry at her that um, she hasn't told... Uh, they went to see the lights at um, the brewery, you know, the Christmas lights, and there was, like, Jesus in the manger. And her her daughter was asking her, what's what's that, Mum? And, um, and her husband turned to her and he said, Angela, why haven't you taught our daughter about Jesus? <laughs> and she said, oh, I'm just going to leave that when she's old enough to make her own decision. And then um, I brought up that, I said to her, well, I said, you know, she is a miracle child after all. And uh, she said, yeah, I know. And then she said, um, you know, my husband was angry. We had to pay so much money for doctors um, when I was giving birth. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I had to have a special paediatric doctor and a, um, a specialist doctor for her when she gave birth. And she had to have a caesarean because she had fibroids that were this big. They were the size of massive oranges. And they didn't even know if the baby was going to be viable um, because it takes all the nutrients and hormones from the baby and also that she would probably bleed to death. So she had her last scan when she was pregnant and so, you know, she's um, having this um, birth and she said she was praying and she said when she delivered the baby, she, she's a very impatient person and she, she wanted to get up and they said to her, you've just had a cesarean, like you, you're, you're basically, you can't use your legs. And she said, well, what's happening? I, don't, I can't feel anything. And they said, well, we don't know. We can't find anything. And she's like, what do you mean you can't find the baby? And, she's, and they said, no, you've given birth to a very healthy baby, but we can't find the fibroids. Like, they're this big. Like, we've got the scans from only a few weeks ago. They had completely disappeared. And she said to the doctor, well, where have they gone? And he goes, I don't know. Like, maybe they've just dissolved back into the body, into the muscles. And she said, does that happen? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was amazing. She said, what about my daughter? And they said, there's nothing wrong with her. So it was just amazing to have that testimony eight years later that she's told us and that she still can see it was a blessing of the Lord. So that was, that was it. <laughs> it's easier to get her to talk about women's things rather than me. I was going <laughs> to mention that, but I thought, no, nah, she, she knows all about that. <laughs> But I suppose I, I, I got that tense testimony mentioned because, you know, when we look, sometimes, you know, we didn't even know about that amazing healing side of it until eight years later. And, uh, you know, that, that woman has been to a, um, a meeting and, and who knows what will come of that. But it's just exciting, really. But in um, Luke 17, here we read, and it came to pass, as he, that's Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So there's these men here, ten lepers. And... Uh, you know, that they're really outcasts of society. Even as far as the city, they weren't allowed to go in the city. And, uh, you know, it says he was in this area of Samaria. And uh, we know that one of them was a Samaritan because it says that later on. And, and the Samaritans, of course, um, as many of us know, were, were hated by the Jews. And uh, how they become Samaritans was uh, they, were, they were half Jew and half Gentiles because uh, the race came about after the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. And uh, that's how the Samaritans came to be. And uh, they really didn't fit in anywhere. And uh, we read on in this story that here they were, they were calling Jesus Master. And uh, did they really understand who he was? No. And does this woman, Angela, understand? No. But 
I suppose uh, just mentioning that we need to keep um, in touch with people who we know and catch up with them every so often because they could be an outcast. They could be a Samaritan. They could be there and hated by everyone. And you don't know where they're, you know, when their time is going to come where they need a miracle. I mean, with Angela there, you know, it, it was just the Lord's timing, wasn't it? And she hasn't come to the Lord yet. She's been to one meeting and, and who knows what will happen. But, but I suppose to me, it's exciting. And uh, we want to build those relationships so that those people... You know, if we've all built those relationships, and we do, and we know we do, uh, then as time goes on, those people will come to us and, uh, you know, they'll end up coming to the Lord. But it says here uh, what happened in verse 14. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And he says, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? So we work on the ten, and we work that the Lord's going to get the one, all the people said. And uh, eventually... The one falls in. I mean, I, I often have a joke, you know, when I'm with Phil saying, this is the sheep, this is the one, you know. And wherever we go, we witness and just say, this is the one. <laughs> we get excited about it. And eventually, someone, it, it is the one. And the, the one gets baptised or, or receives the Holy Spirit. And, and um, when we look at these things, these are the things we want to see, of course. But but, um, you know, Jesus here says, look, there's only this stranger in verse 18 who's, who's come to give glory to God. And, um, but you know what? We don't know what happened to the other nine. It actually says they had to go to the high priest there and uh, they were more than likely Jews because uh, they did exactly what the Old Testament said. And uh, if, if you want to read it, you know, it's incredible what they actually have to do. I'm not going to read it all, but, but um, just a little bit of it. I, w I won't read it. it. It's too much of it. But um, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 14, it goes through exactly what they had to do as far as, uh, you know, for leprosy. We'll just read a bit. I think we've got a bit of time. Leviticus, chapter 4. Sorry, chapter 14. I don't know why I said 4, because it's verse 4 where I'm looking at reading. Chapter 14. I'll just read a little bit of it. In verse 4 it says, Then shall the priest command to take him that is to be cleansed, of leprosy that is, two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. So he had to get two birds, two live birds, and these other things, these three things, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. So he kills one of the birds. Sorry for the bird lovers, but he kills one of the birds, probably chops its head off and puts it under running water. It's the Bible that says it, not me. <laughs> and, um, and then it says, and he... In verse um, 7, And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy uh, seven times and shall pronounce him clean. I think he's pretty dirty at this stage. He's got these dead birds and blood and everything all over him and the, the hyssop and the... It's a pretty messy situation, but he has to go through this and then he has to wash his clothes and, and then he ends up, he has to shave his head and, um, and his beard and his eyelashes and eyebrows and everything. And, and he has to go through this amazing process and, and it, it goes on for some time. And after seven days, he, he has to do it again. He has to shave his head and his beard and his um, eyebrows and, and, um, and then he gets... Um, well, I, I just got to read this verse because I read it and thought, oh my goodness, the things he had to do in verse 14. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot. It goes on. You can read the rest of it later for homework. <laughs> but there was an amazing process and that's 
the law. That's the Old Testament. That's works. But here was this Samaritan that was just cleansed. He came back to give God the glory. And of course, he was made completely whole. And, and that's the Jesus we're part of. The one that, you know, was dead for three days and rose again. The one that, uh, you know, we can call upon in our time of need. We're not entitled, as the Bible says. We come before the throne of grace boldly. Although we're bold, it's still the throne of grace, free unmerited favour. We never earn it. It's grace. Everything we're given is of grace and mercy and compassion and the love of God and, and those things that only come from God alone. And we just, um, we just want to read this chapter. We'll just go to Hebrews chapter 5. And you know how you... I just had to read that bit in, about um, the cleansing and what they had to do. You have to read the rest of it later. It's quite detailed. <laughs> Hebrews chapter And the previous chapter is talking about how we have a high priest that's passed into the heavens, the Son of God, and, and how he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And uh, it's really trying to give us an understanding of, of Jesus, even in the natural sense of what he went through. But um, in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For every high priest that... Uh, taken from men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may off offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins so the Old Testament of course every high priest you know they were ordained they had to do certain things they had to go through certain processes you know so for the sins of the people it says in verse 2 who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. So he himself is talking about Jesus Christ. Um, verse 3, And by reason hereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, and was as was Aaron. So even the high priest was called of God. It wasn't automatic. It wasn't an entitlement. It was only if God chose them. And it's like us, you know, we, we've been chosen. We've been sought out by the Lord there. In verse 5 it says, So also Christ glorifieth not himself to be made an high priest. So even Jesus Christ, he didn't glorify himself. God chose him. And uh, it says, But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, which of course is God. It says in verse 6, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I'm not going to go into that. And in verse 7 it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that is able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. This is talking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about him, strong crying and prayers. It's talking about him, he learned obedience. The Son of God learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Now, I've never seen that before, and I thought it was pretty amazing that there's Jesus Christ, and he had to learn obedience. And that's what we learn. We're not entitled in any way, shape, or form, but we learn the word of God. We grow in the word of God. We're entitled to the word of God and to use the word of God that we might be perfect and help others to be perfect. That's what the Lord's called us to, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. We'll leave it there and hand over to Pastor Chris.